what I appreciate most about your firm is what we just shared. You've been in our shoes, so you understand the pain. Sellers like myself, this is how I feed my family. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Super excited to talk with Paul Raffleson. If you've been in the Amazon seller space at all, you have heard his name. He is the premier law firm when it comes to all things Amazon. And so we are going to talk today about how Paul got started on Amazon. And then we're going to go into what I think is the best service when it comes to issues that you're having with Amazon, whether that's account uh, suspensions, whether that's um, IP claims, uh, you need to be a part of this service that he created called Seller Basics. So we're going to dive into that a little later. Paul, let's just start a little bit. How'd you get started on Amazon? So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I do, I do have a bit of an or origin story. Uh, it wasn't just, hey, you know, let me, you know, here's a bunch of Amazon sellers who need help. Let me get started. I was in law school. Gosh, it's been, I graduated 17 years ago from Villanova University over in uh, suburban Philadelphia. I was just looking for ways to make money, right? I didn't want a big pile of student debt, right? So I'm like looking for ways to make money. And I'm like looking and it all started around like a Black Friday. I'm like, this, you know, these people like line up. People probably, young people and listeners probably didn't know this is a thing, but people would line up all night at Best Buy. There's this store called Circuit City, which was actually crucial to my first jaunt into retail arbitrage, which by the way, was not called retail arbitrage when I started it in, in 2003 right. or two or whatever. It was just, uh, people would call me a scammer. Um, I don't know why I was scamming. I'm like, I'm lawfully buying and selling product. I don't really get the scam. It's just like, but they would, it had no name. It didn't have that, you know, what it was it just didn't exist. And I started in DVDs. So I was flipping like seasons of DVDs because I saw, so I was thinking, okay, well, maybe I'll stand in line and like get those TVs. But then I'm like, well, how do I deliver it? Am I going to be doing like shady Craigslist transaction? Like, like what, how am I going to deliver a flat screen TV to somebody? And is it really money in there? And then I'm looking at DVDs like The Simpsons. Like this is the box sets, right? When they start putting out seasons, right? And I'm like, holy smoke. They discount those to like 15 bucks. They're normally like 40 or 50, 40. They're more than like 50 or 60 bucks for the whole season. And, you know, it could be 10 seasons of these things. But for one day, one weekend, right? Well, everyone's standing in line trying to get that TV at five in the morning. I'm just standing in there trying to get every copy of Simpsons or Family Guy that I can get my hands on. And that's how it kind of started. I just realized I can make money flipping stuff on the internet through not even Amazon because in 03, you know, 203, there was no Amazon, right? It wasn't, that was books, right? But there was half.com, which was sort of eBay's foray to Amazon. Yep. which made it easier to do business on eBay because it was like a single ASIN as opposed to similar to, you know, the way Amazon is now as opposed to having to do, you know, it was just eBay back then was awful. <laughs> and I'll tell you my funny story is the, the couple funny things about that. Um, the lines I used to cause at the Philadelphia post office, there's a post <laughs> office in center city, Philadelphia. I don't even give you starting the Contra Hawken post office, but um, I would, I would go work at the courthouse, the bankruptcy court, and sometimes I'd have like a hundred DVDs to media mail. It was all manual. You didn't just throw your stuff in the mailbox. You had to get it manually weighed and scanned and you had to get a receipt for media mail. And I would come in and I would cause a line and all these poor people were trying to get their Christmas packages mailed at lunch. And it was just like me taking up either, you know, sometimes they only had one person on duty and it was just me. And I'd be sitting <laughs> on the floor of the Philadelphia post office right there. It's like eighth and market across from the old that courthouse that we're in. And or right, actually right behind it. And I just caused this line around the corner and they hated me. They just hated me. And I would sit there on the floor, on the floor reading my law books, just prepping for finals because I wanted to get, you know, make most of my money, obviously, right, right up through finals. And then I wanted to take some time off. So I didn't want to be doing this all the way through Christmas. Like I had windows right. and that's when I started. And then I, from there, I expanded into reselling other things, discovering the Walmart clearance rack. There's another, another funny one you'll appreciate. <laughs> Circuit City. Do you remember Circuit City? Yes, I, yes, I do. Circuit City used to promise was that if you found it cheaper anywhere else, yes, they gave you you they would price match, but they wouldn't just yep. price match. They actually gave you ten percent of the difference. <laughs> so if you bought something for ten dollars, twenty dollars at Circuit City, and you found it for ten dollars at Best Buy, not only would they give you a 
ten dollars, you know, to cover the difference as, as yep. a price match, they'd give you an extra buck, right? <laughs> an, ex- an extra ten percent of the difference, right? Because you right. Well, what I would do strategically is I would arbitrage. I would look at the circulars, and I did this on Black Friday, and I get away with this. So, like, let's say I buy like the Simpsons at Best Buy at Circuit City. The F, you know, there'd be certain seasons, like season two for whatever reason would be fifteen bucks, but season you know, seven would be $60. So let's say I buy season seven for $60 at Circuit City, but I knew it was on sale for $12.99 at Best Buy. I would do that on purpose. And I would do that <laughs> like hundreds of times. Okay, so my receipt was this long. And I would pay full price, right. walk out the store. And just like in the commercial when the little kid goes, yesterday I bought this and today <laughs> I saw this. And that's literally the commercial, how they, do you remember this? Yes, yes. You trade the Walkman. I did the same way. I would literally just be with a smirk on my face. But yesterday I bought all of this. And today I saw this. And it was the best <laughs> buy circular. And it, they would sit there and they would refund me like 48. So like now I'm getting these 12. They're already 12.99 at Best Buy. Now I'm getting probably 10 bucks. So I may have put Circuit City out of business. I'm not sure. They're not around anymore. Right. But it was, it worked. It was a heck of a, it was a hustle. I mean, so I appreciate and respect the hustle of our clients because. I was there. Were you doing this with other sellers? There were no, no, this was all like, I just figured this out on my own. And I just didn't want student debt. There it weren't just, any Facebook groups. There was no fa- the right Facebook. Them. Yeah, there was no Facebook when I started. It just started. <laughs> and they weren't opening up to Villanova. They were at Harvard and Yale and they weren't opening up to the, it was, um, no, it was just, I just wanted, I just was, I had this eager desire. I'm like, there's gotta be a way to make money. Like, I, like the last thing I want to do is like work in a, like a job. While I'm in law school, because like, what are you going to make? You know, right? 10, 15 bucks an hour waiting tables if you get tips. If you're lucky, back then probably not even, right? Probably eight bucks an hour. <laughs> there was no point in that. I just I wanted to make real money. But the thing was, when I graduated, like you, there was no FBA. So for those of you who don't realize, like for the majority of people, what changed Amazon, the tipping point, what made Amazon better than eBay. I mean, a lot of things did, but fulfillment by Amazon, the e-commerce railroad, that. Suddenly, this is when for my clients and their origin stories, right? They said, then I was invited into the story went like this. You know, I was doing like a hundred thousand sales on Amazon. I'm like, okay, this is pretty cool. I'm making like an extra 10 or 15 grand a year. It's like, you know, it's cool. It's like it's my side thing. <laughs> and then they invited me into this program called FBA, fulfillment by Amazon, around 2011 or 2010 or two, you know, everyone has their own version of the story. And that's when I went from being, you know, a hundred thousand dollar seller to a million dollar seller to a two million dollar seller, and and, that, and and that's the story. So really, without fulfillment by Amazon, and so I was a little early to the party, and I and I'm like, well, this is not going to replace me being a lawyer full time, but it sure is fun. And I kept doing it still as a side hustle, like you know, I tried at least to get the Black Fridays in. I do video games. Um, I, 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 to this day, you cannot take me to a Walmart. <laughs> without me walking through the clearance aisle on the phone and look scanning my phone. I, I, I still look and I still have a basement full of stuff that I haven't resold. Mm. Um, I was doing, you know, I had a side hustle of reselling when I was working for General Electric. I used to work for some really big companies like Microsoft. Yep. And Walmart. I should work for Walmart in Arkansas <laughs> and General Electric. And I would side hustle like, you know, so I have a base. But then this whole Amazon thing started for me. And um I never had time to sell through it. But what's funny is a lot of the inventory I didn't sell ended up going up in value because a lot of it was like toys. Right. You know, uh, I had like Swarovski mugs from from Starbucks. Uh, they don't make any more. Um, wrestling toys that I bought for five bucks. They're now worth like 300, 400. I mean, it's, I, have a, I have a basement. It, it's a bit of a, it drives my wife crazy, but uh, I have a basement. And then That's the last awesome. thing I'll say about it is I, a little bit of inside baseball while I was working for Microsoft in Seattle, a lot of people know this, is my wife worked for Amazon. She was oh, a nice. seller performance uh, on the, what they call the seller performance team today. They I hired never her knew that. Because she spoke German. She's, uh, she's Polish, but she's fluent in German, and they needed Amazon.de, needed help. So she worked UK, Germany. And uh, when I would hang out with people, I'd hang out with the entire seller performance team. I would just that we just were most of my friends at Microsoft were much older in their lives. They were, you know, I was in my mid twenties. They were mid to late twenties. They were, you know, older with kids. Right. So the priorities are different. Whereas like the Amazon crew were kind of the younger crew. So we hung out with a seller. Boy, did I pay attention to the, to the dinner conversation. Right. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't actively, actively selling, but I was, you know, it was right. fascinating to hear, hear these people talk. And it was actually one of her coworkers that reached out to me, 
um, many years later, uh, when they were, you know, they started, they started a consulting firm for Amazon sellers and asked me to write a blog post about taxes and, and the injustice of taxes. And that the timing was perfect. I, I had just left General Electric. They had moved, they wanted to move their headquarters from Connecticut to Boston. And I'm just kind of, was done. Like I had helped dismantle this company. GE used to be one of the biggest banks. It used to be, I remember that. you know, um, yeah, we made more money banking than we did selling jet engines or turbines. Um, but due to some, just a lot of things, I mean, GE used to own NBC Universal. So they owned Universal Studios, they owned NBC, they owned Saturday Night Live, right? The whole 30 Rock show is yep. about the fact, is GE, right? Alec Baldwin's character is a GE executive, right? That's the whole <laughs> premise of the show is like, you've got this comedy show owned by, you know, the corporates of GE, like, and it's kind of a funny mix. So, but we sold it all off. We sold that to Comcast. So my, my time at GE, you know, being recruited to go to GE as a lawyer is like getting called to go to the Yankees. I'm not a Yankees fan, by the way. I'm just, but people get the analogy. Um, if you say call to go to the Phillies, I don't think it has quite the same ring to it, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was called to go to GE and I, I spent a number of years there, but we were just dismantling. We sold off the, the TV studio and Universal Studios. We sold off over 50% of the revenue in the financial arm because of changing banking laws. We sold off even the even the appliances. The appliances that you buy from GE today are made by Huawei. They're not really GE. They're just they just you know it's part of the deal. They yep. get to use the GE name, but it's all made in it's all China based. Um, a lot of GE was appliances were today. All of it sold off. So we you know we, we pretty much dismantled this company as under the direction of of Jack Welch. Uh, not, Jack, sorry, not not Jack Welch. Jeff Immelt. But the, the company Jack Welch Bill, which is a great book. If you ever read Jack Welch's book about yes. cheese, you know, yep. for those of you looking for something to read that's old school, go back and read it. You'll read some interesting stuff. Uh, we had moved them from Connecticut to Boston, and I kind of just felt my time was up here. You know, where I was going to go from there, I didn't like. So I really started believing in fate and things like that. It's just because it's weird that all of my life experiences led to this. Like, that's hmm. a weird thing to happen, right? That now I'm this, you know, and that it all started because Amazon sellers had tax law issues that are rooted in constitutional law, which is exactly what I've been doing for like part of my life for 15 years is like wow. studying constitutional tax laws and multi-state laws in the constitution. And it's just with the Amazon background, it's like, wow, it's like as if, as if somebody from above was telling me like yeah. your whole life, I've been pushing you in a direction where, so that you're the perfect person to take on these challenges. And these laws apply, you know, it's the same laws we applied during the price gouging scares during, right? Remember when we were all getting scared off of Amazon with COVID yeah. and price gouging? I mean, we were right out there defending, you know, saying, wait a minute, this is not, that's not what this is. This is a very different situation because we don't have a state pricing mechanism. This is, you know, regulate Amazon, tell us what the rules of the road is, but don't go blaming us, especially before the pandemic was even officially declared, right? Like yeah. you know, some people got a really bad situation because of the price gouging, you know, supposed to price gouging, but I'm like, there was no pandemic. Right. I mean, literally the, these were, we're talking, you know, the, the days when the president of the United States says that there's no, nothing to worry about in February. Right. And people, and so we defended that. I mean, we, we went up, we take those, those cases seriously. And so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it, it, it is a moment for me to, when, I, when you run me through my origin story like this, and I think about it, it's, it's an odd, strange series of events that led me to this position where like, okay, this is what you do. This is what you should be doing. So, so you're in corporate, and then you you, you start working with sellers on these various issues, and uh, and then your your eyes are kind of open to the you know Amazon ecosystem. You you already experience it as a seller, but then you start to see all these issues that those of us who've been selling on Amazon for any amount of time, we we know. And this is what I always tell everyone: looks at it and they think it's so easy. It's not easy, and you know, in any business, you're going to have issues. But navigating these issues that you work with at Seller Basics are extremely challenging because unless you know how to respond, you know, to the cases like your team does, a lot of times you'll end up, especially if you're just a lay seller, right, and you haven't dealt with them, you'll end up kind of beating your head against the wall. So you started to see, right, I guess, you know, these sellers that were having these difficulties. And I imagine because of your, your experience, like you understand then how to craft these cases, whether it's somebody's account is suspended or their ASIN has been taken down. So talk to us a little bit about that. And, you know, what I appreciate most about your firm is what we just shared. You kind of you've been in our shoes. So you understand the pain 
you know, and we've talked about this before, how, uh, you know, sellers like myself, this is how I feed my family. And so it is challenging at times because Amazon owns the sandbox and you feel like you're David kind of going up against Goliath, you know, with these issues, which is why I think Seller Basics is so relevant, why every seller should have a subscription to Seller Basics. So tell us a little bit about that, what you see out there and some of the things that your team works on daily. It comes down to one thing, right? This concept of what, who are we? Right now, this this especially applies to the private label sellers, but not doesn't, but also applies to the retail arbitrage community. So, the concept of the global small business, like that's an oxymoron in 1991, right? If I say, "Oh, I'm a global small business," how is that possible in 1991? You know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Uh, I have global reach, but I'm a small business. Impossible. E-commerce and FBA. Um, and Alibaba, right? Putting those three together, right? Letting me run uh, a business where I'm importing products from China, selling in th- across the country, selling across different countries through these platforms, my products. That was all because of Amazon, really. You know, you could argue eBay to some extent, but really Amazon is what allows you to sell it for scale, right? Remember, like we were saying earlier. I went from being 100,000 to all of a sudden a million, then two million. My observation, you know, five years ago when I was asked to write that blog post was, you know, yeah, okay, there's a tax issue out there, but there's a bigger issue. There's a nobody serving the global small business because Mm -hmm. the lawyer, Amazon sellers are going to, you know, maybe that lawyer is really good if you want to set up a tea shop in the middle of your town in Main Street, USA. Maybe they're Mm -hmm. they're specifically known in that jurisdiction. They understand your challenges, right? They know the township. They know the permitting issues, the signage uh, regulations, but that's not who the average Amazon seller is. These are sellers in interstate commerce, right? Even arbitrage sellers, you are sellers in interstate commerce, maybe not always international commerce, but interstate commerce. And lawyers who do that typically serve up market, right? That's why I was a lawyer for Microsoft, Walmart, G. I was not... If you would ask me in 2010, you know, would you ever have a client that's not, you know, on the S&P or, or doing 100 million? I'd say that that'd be rare, very rare for me because that's just not who typically needs me, right? We do complex, broad, you know, we have to have a good understanding of the national, international market. But now you have, you know, 100,000 plus, actually more than a million plus, but I mean, serious sellers, let's say, in the United States. When nobody there to help them, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, their competition, unfortunately, in China doesn't care at all. Like it's, I always joke about how many clients we have who are based in China. We don't have a lot of China-based clients, right? <laughs> That's not a un- coincidence. It's because the, r- the ramifications, the implications for being wrong are a lot less when you live in China, <laughs> right. right? But when you live in the United States and you can be facing, you know, severe legal uh, fines, penalties, you can get sued, you can lose everything, you can lose your house. You want to play by the rules. And I've, I've actually spoken to Congress about how there's some, you know, it's kind of, unf- you know, you're creating a real tactical advantage for China right now. And we've <laughs> had that conversation, but I'm digressing. So that's sort of what we saw. So we built a law firm around that. And the idea of the law firm is we don't have to be 90% of the time our clients, their scalability in that we know our clients' issues better than they do before they even know us. Mm-hmm. They, they think there, there's a lot of overlap, like 98% of our clients who sell through Amazon as a primary source or e-commerce, right? We kind of know their challenges better than they do before they even walk in the door. They're surprised by that because everyone thinks, oh, I'm different. Well, it's like, no, but we kind of know. We've seen this a million times before. And so there's scalability in that. So that allows us to take sort of big law concepts and make it affordable. So we've done that through our law firm. But then there's the idea of like, well, what else can we do to make this one more affordable and more just user friendly? Because I think people are afraid of lawyers, they're afraid of the hourly rate concept, they're afraid that law lawyers, you know, you know, it's like it's this nebulous concept, like, give me X thousand dollars, my hourly rate is this, and you know, next thing you know, you get a bill. Like, how did that happen? You know, it's <laughs> like we get it. And sometimes we have to do it that way. But, you know, my business has been built on as much flat rate as possible using the economies of scale. The fact that we already know how to solve the problem. We already know how to solve for X most of the time. Mm. And then with Seller Basics, which is separate and apart from our law firm, 
Now we built something that's nothing new. Seller basics is like, it's almost like insurance. Like we're not really insuring any losses. Like, I mean, if you're offline for a day, like we don't pay you for those losses, but you could argue it's almost like insuring the cost, you know, because what we see is a lot of consultants who aren't even lawyers um, are out there and they're making, they're giving you help. They're helping you. And sometimes that's fine. But sometimes the help crosses the line to practicing law. So we're sort of saying, how can we build a program where it can be technical experts like Joy, who are just doing their thing, who join our team, who Joy Williams is amazing, who leads our operations, who can help you through just Amazon compliance that really doesn't require a lawyer. But then how do we offer a lawyer when you need one and make that affordable? And so we've kind of copied, really, I mean, it's nothing new. We've copied the legal plans, uh, the same legal plan I used to have at Microsoft but that's uh, called Hyatt Legal. It's owned by MetLife or, you know, Legal Shield or, you know, there's, there's yeah. nothing, we're not taking a new business model through Seller Basics. One, for $99 a month, right? You can have, if anything goes wrong with your account or ASIN, because more, more at the ASIN level, I, know, I appreciate how Amazon says that if you work with us, your account won't go down. I'm like, well, we haven't really seen a lot of account suspensions in the last two years. We've right. seen more ASIN level ASIN. suspensions. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, <laughs> It's like, thanks, but um, <laughs> that's clever wordplay. And wordplay, I was trained to, to, to sp- I love that sort of double sp- corporate double speak that I was, I was trained in very, very extensively when I was younger <laughs> in big corporations. Like, I get that. So we have this program now. So, right. So if your account goes down, you're paying $90 a month and it's like insurance. It's like, if your anything happens to your account, we're there to help you. You have somebody to call. You don't have to panic nobody's going to take advantage of you in your time of need because our rates are fixed and there's actually no extra charges, right? We actually started with some like little like co-pays and we call them co-pays because we like to borrow. Food. But we've actually gotten rid of that because um, our belief is that if we get to scale and if we get enough members, which we are really growing fast, um, there's no need for it. Mm. Um, and so the idea is like, yeah, if your account goes down, if your ASIN goes down, if you're having an issue, uh, we have a whole team of compliance folks, Amazon compliance folks who are ready to help you. No extra costs. You know, pretty much anything other than having to go to court or litigation, your Amazon seller basics team is there to help you. We love an ounce of prevention. So call them up, use them to figure out what is uh, what you can do to be safe, make sure you're in compliance. And then on top of that, we have this network of lawyers. Our law firm is sort of the main one. But we actually have other lawyers too. So like if you have an FDA question. Maybe you sell a product that involves Food and Drug Administration. You didn't know it. You just found out. You're like, how can I talk to an FDA lawyer? We we have FDA lawyers for you, right? And you can set up a call with one, you know, as a part of your membership. We'll arrange for that. And you can have uh, a good 15, 20 minute chat with the lawyer and just understand what your issue is and what, need, and what if anything, needs to be done. And then from there, uh, you know, if further work needs to be done, it's done at a discounted rate, but at least you're getting an answer. You're not going to Google. You're hearing it right from the horse's mouth. This is your problem. This is your solution. And that network, outside network of lawyers, right, is separate and apart from your members. I mean, it's it's part of the benefit, but it's, you know, then you work with that lawyer that's totally separate from Seller Basics. So we kind of built this sort of just, yeah, to have the Kyat Legal Plan concept and built it for sellers. And at $99 a month, or like we say, what roughly three bucks and change a day, yeah. you know, you could have your account protected. I mean, every seller. And, and, and one of the things I think I'm most proud of, and this is the last thing I'll say is the IP claims, mm-hmm. because this has been for resellers. This has been absolute nightmare, right? Like you're selling product. It's authentic. Why are you getting trademark infringement? Why are you getting counterfeit? If it's authentic, you bought it at Marshall's is Marshall's buying counterfeit products. We don't think so. We know they're not. They're a multi-billion dollar company. Their supply chain's clean. What we realized, and this is sort of something that I realized when I really took over leadership of the program this year, is I said, you know, if you read through Amazon's policy, there's a lot here about how they support the first sale doctrine, which is the idea that anything you legally own, you have the right to resell. (laughs) And that all these people who are filing these IP claims and using brand registry to take you down, that's actually a violation of Amazon's policies and seller code of conduct. (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, why is nobody holding any of these brands accountable for that? So that became my mission this year. And I have had confirmation from Amazon that we have successfully had the brand registry rights of many brands revoked for the mm. work that we do. So when brands file false IP claims against you and you've got great documentation, 
In a number of cases, Amazon will, if they abuse you, they, they're abusive towards you, will take their brand registry rights away. So I say, I like to collect those brand registry rights, like in the movie Predator, when he has the skull, <laughs> the, the, the little uh, sash of skulls. I'm like, I imagine that is like my brand registry rights of the different brands that we've taken away <laughs> that are being abusive. Because Amazon loves resellers. Right. Resellers are great for Amazon's customers. We resellers do, we, we breach Mac. I mean, what could be better for Amazon's customer than selling something below the ma- minimum advertised price that the manufacturers want you to maintain? Mm. They absolutely love it. So anyone who tells you arbitrage is dead and Amazon doesn't like resellers, I can tell you that I 100% from my conversations with Amazon disagree with you completely. I think well, I think Amazon loves it. Yeah, and when you just think about uh, Bezos' original vision, right? You want to be the everything store. And I mean, they were selling millions and they still do used books, right? Right. <laughs> so those are big books purchased somewhere else new, selling them as used. <laughs> I know it is. That's a different, that's a different task that we, that's a hard one right now. Those, the, the textbooks, news books are fine. It's the textbooks right now. Right. See, like perfect thing, you know, come before you spend a ton of money, be a seller basics member, come talk to us about textbooks and we'll tell you. Yeah, I've heard that that's real. That landscape has totally changed. Right. Yeah, right. we textbooks. We should have. A, yeah. It, it, and it's <laughs> unfortunate because I think it's it's really it's one of those, you know, we started a nonprofit, as you know, called the online merchant skilled. And we, we we do a lot of, you know, believe it or not, there's like sellers have rights. This is my kind of final thoughts of of this whole thing is that, you know, in addition to everything else I do, a lot of it's just so I can go out there and like the laws need to be rewritten. The laws are ancient. They're wrong. So we bring court cases. We just won a big court case in Pennsylvania about the taxes. Actually, the Pennsylvania Court of Appeals, the Commonwealth Court said that for the last five years, they, you know, everyone's saying that if you use an Amazon warehouse, which is, you know, if you put your inventory in FBA and your stuff ends up in every Amazon warehouse, you have a tax nexus in every state. Well, the Pennsylvania Commonwealth Court was the first court to actually evaluate our constitutional claim. And they said, absolutely not. It is unconstitutional mm. to, 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 to basically for a state to a certain nexus solely based on Amazon presence. So <laughs> we're winning the we're winning little battles here and there, but it's a cool little nonprofit called the Online Merchant Skill that I think everyone should be a part of. But but the idea of this is that you know sellers have rights. Believe it or not, sellers have rights. And these are civil rights cases, right? These cases right. we bring in court, these are your civil rights. These are your right to make a living. We are, in a, mm-hmm. we, you know, George Washington was so concerned about commerce across the interstate that we have a commerce clause in our constitution. And that's what these cases are about. Stuff that George Washington was thinking about. That's what's so cool about it. That's, that's really what motivates me. If you want to kind of know, like, but, you know, like I got to make a living, like something's got to keep me from going back to corporate because it's very, very cush there. Not everyone hated their nine to five. They paid as well. We didn't work a lot. So I've got to make a living. But what's so cool about this is the idea that we can actually make that change, that we can, you know, be in the law books and change the constitutional way of things to adapt to e-commerce. And that's what makes me get out of bed every morning more than anything. That's um, awesome. But the rest of it is great. I mean, the you know, the, the stuff we did on the M&A side is a law firm, mm. Seller Basics helping sellers, helping real human beings. Like it's definitely a more fulfilling feeling, you know, like I've helped GE save a hundred million dollars and it's like, I'll get like a, you know, a thank you and a gift card to Applebee's, you know what <laughs> I mean? Like it's not, it's not really a fulfilling uh, event. It's, it's a rounding error in their mind. Um, here we get to help real people. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that that that's uh, super exciting. I know it's, it's still kind of the wild, wild west and you're on the frontier um, you know, there's not a lot of folks that have your level of expertise just because it's still, I think, a relatively new industry. Again, this is a Paul Raffleson. If you're listening to this, highly encourage you. You want to go to sellerbasics.com. If you are an Amazon seller, this is a no brainer at ninety nine dollars a month. Let me just run through some of the things that you get. So we all know that if you get your account suspended on Amazon, it can be a traumatic event, especially if you're selling a lot of money. His team's going to help you with that. They're going to help with counterfeit claim appeals, intellectual property claim appeals, inauthentic claim, Asian suspensions, demand letters from brands. I've received a number of those. And they also are open to doing uh, legal business strategy calls. And let me tell you what else their team offers. And I've used a number of these. These, This is not covered underneath the seller basic plans. But I just want to show you the breadth and the wealth of their experience. They do intellectual property licensing, 
trademark filings. They do merger and acquisitions. Uh, my partner and I actually work with Paul and his team. And if you have a brand that you are looking to sell, I highly recommend you use Paul and his team. They will go through that APA with a fine tooth comb and uncover whatever things are unfavorable to you. So that's what his team also does. They do strategy, Amazon strategy consultation. They do estate planning, business continuity planning, tax law. And so these are all, again, this is not covered under seller basics, but this is also what his law firm offers. So if you're listening to this, and again, you've been selling on Amazon any amount of time, you know that you are going to experience road bumps. We have almost, you could probably say every quarter, we'll have an issue that we can't solve ourselves. And we'll turn to Paul and his team to help us work to, and help us get through the issue. We actually had an ASIN suspended, I guess it was probably about a year and a half ago. And that ASIN was... It was gross sales of $15,000 a day, just one ASIN. And so we turned to Paul and his team and he helped us get that ASIN going again. So if you, again, are selling on Amazon for any amount of time, go to sellerbasics.com. I love what his nonprofit uh, that he's working on does as well. And that's the online guild.com. Is that right? Onlinemergesguide.org, which is a... Certified, not you know, it's a trade association, but it is a not profit. I don't make, I don't, they don't pay me a dime. Yep. And I heard about that first through Steve Simonson. Are you familiar with Steve at all? I just saw Steve in England the other day. I, I love you? Steve. Steve is a wonderful yeah. person. I tell everyone, Steve is my number one person that I've met in the Amazon seller space. Uh, his integrity, his knowledge, and his wisdom to me is just off the charts. I've never met anyone like him. I don't know, you know, if you feel that way about it. I do. No, I, I do. I, I actually often go to him for whenever I'm having questions and I, I he's my go-to. I mean, yeah. I think he and I share the same passion for activ activism and, mm. and, and changing the landscape. But, you know, we struggle. It's it, it's hard. You know, this is something, you know, going to the nonprofit side of things, this is something that large companies do all the time. You know, when they want to uh, prevent uh, New York State wants to outlaw sugary beverages larger <laughs> than a small, you know, suddenly you Coke, Pepsi, Starbucks and Jamba Juice holding hands, singing Kumbaya, putting millions of dollars in the coalition and they're going to court, they're lobbying. They're doing, and I'm thinking to myself, the sellers, we are the, we have the potential to be one of the most powerful lobbies in the, in the entire world. Mm. And we do not leverage our, our numbers. I agree. And our bill, Amazon doesn't vote where well, there's a million of us, right? Mm. Sellers in this country. And we all have, we're all in different dis congressional districts. We all have a voice mm. that if we can just coordinate it and, and, you know, get sort of activated, um, really, really level playing field with Amazon. Um, yeah. I hope that the message will get out there virally so that we can really start making some differences. I'm proud of what we've done kind of mm. with the resources we've had, but you know, Steve and I um, both kind of firmly believe that there needs to be something out there really fighting for sellers and, and, and it should be much stronger. You know, we should have lobbyists knocking on Congress's door every day, pushing our agenda, not Amazon pushing their agenda. We need to push our own agenda. So that's, Good you know, like one yeah, of which is, I'm going, uh, hoping to go on a trip with Steve to Vietnam in April. So uh, get to spend some time with them there. Uh, that'd All be right. cool. Hey, thanks again for joining us. Uh, again, if you're listening, this is Paul Raffeson. Uh You want to go to sellerbasics.com, check out the program that they have. They're highly recommended. Uh, I could go through a list of testimonies of sellers that we know, sellers in a group that we help co-lead. Uh, and that list is extremely long on folks that were in dire situations, but because they were part of Seller Basics, they were able to get their situation right through Paul and his team. So go to sellerbasics.com, check it out. Paul, thank you so much for your time, appreciate it. Thank you, I appreciate you. Good talking. Okay.